It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you a world-renowned uh, speaker and a uh, very knowledgeable expert in the area of customer service and customer care. I'd like to welcome, please give a round of applause to uh, Mr. John Scholl. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Buenos dias. Bon dia. Good morning. It's great to be here in Cancun with DHL. We're going to have some fun here this morning. What I'm going to show you is how you can destroy your competition. Would you like that, Roger? Would you like to crush your competition? That's what this seminar is all about in the next hour and a half or so, okay? I'm going to share some ideas that I believe, whether it be Colombia or Canada or Mexico or Trinidad, I don't care what country it is, I believe that if DHL Express, your entire staff, provides awesome experience, you will own the market. And what we're talking about here is that your employees have to provide exceptional, unusual service every single day. The most important person in DHL is not here today. The most important person is that little employee that's in your offices, that's answering the phone, that's the driver. It's the person interacting with your customers through the internet. That's the most important person. Your success is really dependent on how effective in Brazil those hundreds of employees are. Okay. So no matter what country you are, you got to provide exceptional, unusual, noticeable customer service. Now here's the problem. Everywhere in the world, every company thinks it's really cool with customer service. Every company is smoking pot or something. They, they just, this stuff goes to their head. They think they're absolutely unbelievable in customer service. I have been in almost every single country that's in this room doing open public seminars. And I have not had anybody say Federal Express or DHL or UPS is a service leader in my country. My objective is to provide some ideas that you can use today Roger, so that in your individual markets, and I know Mexico has got such a powerful brand, but why not create a customer experience so superior that you just stand out from everybody else? That's what we're going to talk about. By the way, uh, congratulations to Mexico for the, being the overall winner last night. I was sitting with uh, Jaime from Central America, and I thought he should just stand up on stage, you know, because he kept winning prizes all the time. So uh, I was somewhat impressed. And what we're going to talk about are some ideas that I think will complement what Jared talked about with first choice. And if, when I had a chance to talk to Samuel and Roger and Antonio and Jared, there were several objectives that I heard. One is that DHL was looking for fast and reliable service absolute empowerment. And we're going to talk about empowerment this morning. That means that every employee in your organization has to be able to make a fast decision on the spot, and it better be in favor of the customer. The last thing we want is an employee to say, let me talk to my manager. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. He's in Cancun at a conference. <laughs> And then you got to have consistent service recovery. We're going to talk about that. You got a little card out. And then I think you got to put the customer first. You got to have a mindset at DHL that there's only one thing that counts, and that's taking care of a customer. If the customer wins, DHL wins. And then we got to go the extra mile to make a customer happy. And again, I am speaking probably to the converted in this room. The difficulty is each of you have hundreds of employees, in Canada 3,500 employees, that your success is in the hands of that little employee. And in Latin America, some of your employees are making six, $700 a month. So you're totally dependent on what that individual does. And then 
we have to sell service, not boxes. One of the paradigm changes I'd like to make today, Roger, is that you're no longer in the box business, you're no longer in the express business, you're in the service business. Okay. Major paradigm switch. Some people think they're in the transportation business, the shipping business. The paradigm switch is if we can get DHL to understand that you don't sell boxes, you don't sell shipping, what you sell is service. And then I believe that if you, and I'm going to show you in the last slide, that if you have customer retention, you can double the growth of DHL. In your individual markets, if you cut your defection rates in half, you will double the growth of your business. How many here would like to double this year the growth of your business? So we're not talking about going out and getting new customers. What we're talking about is how do we create a customer experience that is so unbelievable that your customers say, screw UPS or Federal Express. There's only one company I'm ever going to do business with, and that's DHL. Right? That's what we want to do. So I think there's nine things that you got to do to drive the service strategy. Now, I believe that the number one reason most companies in the world are not customer driven is because leadership doesn't understand the strategy. I will show you this morning financially how money falls from the skies if you absolutely provide incredible service. Now, we're not talking about new planes. We're not talking about new trucks. What we are talking about is taking the 13,000 people that you have in the Americas and creating an atmosphere, Samuel, so when they get up in the morning, they think, cool, this is my day to take care of customers instead of, damn. Okay. So number one, this is a strategy. This group is the top leadership team of DHL. By the way, congratulations. I understand that the America is the most profitable part of DHL. Is that correct? But I mean, you guys are really doing good. And by the way, I am a small business in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The temperature down here is a little bit nicer than Minneapolis. But I do a lot of business in Mexico. And I am so excited about the opportunity for cross-border ground trucking into Mexico back and forth between the United States. I believe that it will be the single biggest home run you have hit this year. And it will impact Mexico much more than anybody in this room suspects. And it will dramatically help you turn around the United States market. So I am absolutely, I am your first customer. I am ready for the cross-border truck, and I've been fighting for it for like eight or nine years ever since NAFTA was passed. So I think that you are going to see, Roger, the biggest turnaround you've ever seen, both in the United States and I suspect, where's our Mexican friends here? How many people here are from Mexico? You know, I know that you guys kind of dominate the Americas, but let me tell you what, I think, Roger, their numbers are going to probably be way too low. You may have to have them rebudget it because of what's going to happen with this. <laughs> now, the second thing I think, go ahead, Roger. You want to put Roger on, Jay? No? Okay. The second thing I think you got to do if you're going to be a service leader is you got to look at the policies, the procedures, the systems that you have in place that are miserable that cause delays that customers hate. Okay, so how long does it take to open an account? We talked about moving from five days to two days. Did you notice that when you entered Mexico, they had you fill out two forms? And you put your name down, I believe, three different times. Now, let me just show you what I talk about with policies and procedures, because I'm sure DHL Express would not do anything like this, correct? <laughs> now, I'm suspecting a huge percentage of the people coming into Cancun are from the United States, but it really doesn't matter. I did this a few weeks ago when I went into to, uh, Mexico City. But all this stuff that's on here is on your passport. 
and they scan your passport. But see, sometimes people are idiots because they know that labor costs are free, particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean where labor costs are very low. So you add more people, you create more policies and procedures, you piss off more customers, you cause more delays. And that's what the Mexican government does. By the way, the United States government does it in most other countries because we create all the stupid policies and rules and procedures. You know what they're going to do with this paper after you've filled it out? Nothing! <laughs> they're spending millions of dollars a day with some moron that created these stupid policies and procedures. Now, here's the point I'm trying to teach at DHL. We don't want you guys to have dumb policies and procedures because you could have the nicest people in the world in Brazil. But you could have, and it wouldn't happen, I'm sure, in Brazil. But, <laughs> but you could have crazy policies and procedures. I remember one time I was in Mexico. I was shipping something to Coreto, and uh, I filled out the DHL thing with a red pen. And they made me redo it because it was in red. Now, I, you know, I, these are, so anyhow, the third thing you've got to have is speed. You know, that little clip that you started off uh, Samuel with, you know, talking about reliable and speed. People love speed. Speed means if it normally took 10 hours, how do I do it in one hour? If it normally took five days, how do I do it in four hours? That's speed. And then we've got to eliminate waste and frugality. We've got to be more aggressive at eliminating costs because if, let me tell you what, in your market, price is still important. And then we've got to hire the right people and learn to love them. You know, I was reading uh, Fortune magazine on the way down. And the headlines on the cover story is 100 best companies to work for. And I, I went through it twice. And by the way, I was going through it and I didn't see Federal Express on here. So then I read it again and they were number 97. But wouldn't it be great if DHL was here? But let me tell you the comment that was here that I thought was really good. And this was how to get hired by the best company. Get ready to interview and interview and interview. The process varies widely from one company to another, but you could be facing a series of 12 to 15 one-on-one -on -one chats or one long interview with a panel of up to 50 current employees. Let me tell you what I think happens in, in most countries is that if the person's got a pulse, they're hired. Let me tell you what, I wouldn't be surprised in each of your markets that you have some dead people on the payroll. <laughs> so if you're going to be more productive, we've got, to, we've got to hire the right people, and then we've got to learn to love them. And then the next step that I'm going to talk about this morning is that we've got to have empowerment. Empowerment, again, means that every one of your employees has to make a very fast decision, and it always has to be in favor of the customer. I don't care if you think the customer is crazy. It's irrelevant. The customer is the customer, and the customer is always right, because your objective is to double your business. Your objective should be to destroy your competition. And the only way to do that is to make sure you got empowerment. And the next thing up here, you got to have service recovery. When something goes wrong, and I guarantee you things will go wrong, because no matter how committed you are, <laughs> bad things happen. And it's how you handle the service recovery. I'm going to talk about that this morning. And then Jared talks about first choice. You have to train and educate all employees. So if in Canada you have 3,500 or if in Columbia you have 600, you got to make sure that every single employee is trained on the art of customer service and they wake up in the morning, they say, my job is to take care of customers. If you have the best people in your country working for you, your competition's up quick. And then the last thing you got to do is measure the results so that you know the outcome. By the way, uh, most of you or everybody should have been gotten, received a copy of my book, Achieving Excellence Through Customer Service. The difficulty with what I'm going to do this morning is some of you are going to forget most of what I said. So I do encourage you to take the book, read it, underline it, highlight it, so that you understand some of the principles that are in here. And after the seminar, if anybody has a copy of the book, uh, let me know and I'll autograph it. And I know that Gustavo already did that. And I would be delighted to do that. So if you look at Jeffrey Imlet, GE. Now, I'm assuming that everybody knows that GE is the best managed company in the world. Would you agree? 
They got the most effective CEO award, other than John Mullen, right? Okay. <laughs> and Emlet said, developing and motivating people is the most important part of my job. They are investing $1 billion in developing their people. Now, I look at this plane behind me here from DHL Express, and the question I have is how much money does DHL spend every day on maintenance of the aircraft? I wouldn't be surprised you spend more money on maintenance of the aircraft in one given day than do you do all year on developing people. Now, we know that if you don't do the maintenance, that aircraft is going to crash. Well, here's the problem. you got 13,000 people working for you here in the Americas that during the day crash because nobody has spent any money to the degree that you should, Jared, helping them be more successful. See, you could go to any school for the rest of your life in Colombia, in Jamaica, in Mexico, in Guatemala, any of the countries that are here in this room, Canada, and there's not one educational institution that's going to teach your employees the art of service. So if you want to have the best people in your country, then it's going to be your responsibility to help that person be more successful. You've got to build them, train them, and develop them. So you spend money on aircraft so they fly. You got to spend, and Jared's helping, you got to do that with development of people. Now, what you got to do, because we got the leadership here for DHL Express, you got to be the one that's pushing DHL saying, I need more. I want to train my people more. I want more, faster, Jared. You're not going fast enough for me. Would you like that? That's really what we want. Um, what makes GE great through good years and bad? GE consistently does the things the rest only wish they could do. They have an ability to change directions on it bashedly. Now, here's the key. They develop people, they evaluate them, and they act on the results. They have an extraordinarily high-performing organization. Now, every year, GE terminates 10% of its workforce. Shell Express in the Americas that no one has better people in each of the different countries in this room. Your competition, they're dead. See, you can have all the nice aircraft and the trucks and all that other equipment, but DHL Express is made up of people. And if you got the most high-performing people, you got the best people at every single position, your competition does not have a chance. Would you agree? So let's talk about how we do that. Emlet said, I spend about a third of my time on people. We recruit, we train, we develop, we improve, we think about people constantly. Now, if you want it to be like Emlet, maybe you'd want to keep and practice some of those same principles with your team. Develop, recruit, build. So I think business has been misled into a strategy that favors the investments in technology and equipment instead of the development and training of people. I'm here to show you financially what happens if you will invest a little bit of money developing your people. So Roger, if you had the best people at every single position here in the Americas, you can double your revenue this year. So people's responsibilities and skill requirements are changing. You never know who's going to talk to a customer in your company. Now, let me. I really believe the most important person at DHL is not here. It's that little guy that's in your company that's answering the phone right now. It's the person that's delivering a package. It's the person on the, on the, the telephone that, that's interfacing with a complaint. It is your employees, okay? And, if, and one thing, you know, most of you guys are from Latin America, and one of the things I find about Latin America is people are really nice. Would you agree? I mean, there's kind of an inherent culture in Latin America. What we just need to have is a little bit more speed, a little bit more empowerment, a little bit more putting the customer first. When I checked into the Fiesta Americana this afternoon, yesterday afternoon, I mean, the people were really nice. They had about 15 people behind the counters, and it only took about 30 minutes to check in. 
See, the mistake that some companies make is they think that adding extra people is service. Baloney. You don't need more people at DHL Express in each of your countries. You probably need 25% less. You just need better people. And what you really need to do is help some of the people that have died on the job, and I bet you have some, identify your most favorite competitors. I mean, you really can't afford to keep those people. See, the best service pros are just simply outstanding employees. And you want to develop them. By the way, when you put people through first choice, and when you start building people, you're going to see some people that say, hey, this is cool stuff. I like it, okay? And then you're going to see some people that don't respond at all to it. Now, if you had a plant, and you kept fertilizing it and watering it, but it actually died, what would you do with the plant? You'd get rid of it, right? So if you have an employee that you're spending money on, and you're giving them the tools to be more effective, and they're drinking from the fountain, and it ain't working. What do you do? Hasta luego, right? <laughs> Let me give you an example of a great customer service role model, and I want to teach you some principles. This is Commerce Bank. It's based out of uh, Philadelphia. They have uh, locations in New York, New Jersey, and now in West Florida. For all of those at the corporate office, I have a task for you. I would like you to open an account at Commerce Bank sometime in the next week or two. I'd like you to benchmark DHL against Commerce Bank. The Commerce model is they want to be a growth retailer, not a banker. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think most banks in the world suck at service. Would you agree? In fact, most banks hate customers. Commerce Bank loves customers. So they have a unique deposit-driven retail focus, and they believe, this is important now for DHL for a principal, that service, not rate, drives growth. So if you had $1,000 in your checking account, $1,000 in your savings account, the interest will be significantly less than the competition. They believe at Commerce Bank that if you have provided incredible, awesome, unbelievable service that you've never seen in in your whole life, that that's more important than your interest rate. By the way, how many here know what the interest rate is on the money in your checking account? Oh, I got some financial people here in this room. That's the most hands I've ever seen go up. Okay. I'm sitting on a plane my first time. I'm going to Commerce Bank, and I got my book, Loyal for Life, and that I'm going through, and there's stuff in there in Commerce Bank, and this guy nudges me next to me. He pulls out his billfold, and he's got a Commerce Bank credit card in there, and he shows me the card. I said, how long have you been doing business with Commerce Bank? He said, about a year. I moved there uh, to the Philadelphia area. I said, how much money you got in your checking account? He said, about $5,000. I said, do you know what the interest rate is? He said, no and I don't care. Okay. But I believe at DHL, if you have service that is so unbelievable, and we're not talking to any more people, you need less people to do what I'm talking about, that you will find that it will drive business to DHL. And at Commerce Bank, they have legendary customer experience. And they believe growth is essential to success and value. Now, Commerce Bank is open five days a week from 7.30 in the morning till 8 o'clock at night. Is your bank open from 7.30 in the morning till 8 at night, Monday to Friday? By the way, on Saturdays, the bank is open from 7.30 in the morning until 6 o'clock at night. And on Sundays, it's open from 11 to 4. Is your bank open those kind of hours? Now, have you ever been stuck in traffic and got to the bank five or ten minutes late? What does the bank say? Come on in. Come back tomorrow. Well, at Commerce Bank, they open ten minutes early and they close ten minutes late. They don't advertise it. It's part of a strategy. Their goal is to create a customer experience that nobody else has ever experienced before in their life, okay?
Now think about DHL Express. How complicated would it be throughout the Americas for your offices, for your published hours, to be open 10 minutes early and to close 10 minutes late? Not too complicated, is it? It's New York City's only five-star bank. Now, if you called Commerce Bank, in fact, let me ask you another question. If I called your bank right now, what country are you from? Mexico. Mexico. If I, and which bank are you with? Banco V. Vilvaivikai. Okay, if I called them right now, it's about uh, 9.15 in the morning. Will a live person answer the phone? If I called your DHL office in Mexico, will a live person answer the phone? Or Bogota, or any of the cities that you're in. Now, at Commerce Bank, they have live people 24 hours, seven days a week. And the phone is typically answered without even a ring. Now, if you looked at your competition out there, you know, they have voicemail. They have this integrated thing, push two, push five, go to hell. <laughs> in Commerce Bank, it's free anywhere in the United States. They have knowledgeable, bright, caring people that answer the phone. They have one phone number they use in the United States. That's it. Now, I would encourage you to give them a call any hour that day. But you know, the time I want you to call them is not four in the afternoon. I'd like you to call them at like two in the morning. I was with my uh, nephew for New Year's Eve. It was about 10 o'clock in the evening. And he was complaining about his bank in Minneapolis on how bad they were at customer service. I had my cell phone with me. I said, Bill, I said, let me show you what great customer service is. So I dialed Commerce Bank. This is New Year's Eve. Now, what would happen, by the way, if I called... <laughs> your bank on New Year's Eve, <laughs> or DHL, <laughs> okay, and it, they, there was no ring, they just picked up the phone, and the person is knowledgeable, bright, and caring. By the way, if you're going to call from outside the United States, this is their international phone number, okay. Now, I'm just trying to teach you some principles here, and I'm going to show you financially what happens. Uh, their store growth is their, their assets uh, went up 18% in 2006. I'm waiting for the financial numbers, which I'll have. By the way, they were just acquired by a Canadian bank, and which is bad. Um, <laughs> and uh, Vernon Hill is, uh, is now going to be uh, opening up four banks in London, and he will do the same exact thing in London they did in Manhattan. So I'm going to show you some numbers, because these are some principles. You're going to notice assets were up 18%, deposits up 19%, loans up 23%, revenues up 17%, expenses up 18%, net income up 11%, net income per share up 1%. Let me tell you what, Commerce Bank has a 20% premium on its stock, because of what it does with building a customer experience. So one way, this will motivate Mullen, by the way, one way in bond to have higher numbers if you create a customer experience, you absolutely have a higher premium on the value of the company. The strategy at Commerce Bank is to hire outgoing people pleasers and then we train, train, and train. They spend $19 million a year training and developing their 14,000 people. They're constantly building and developing their people. And they teach every employee at Commerce Bank several things. The wow principles, the smart principles, is it takes two people to say no. If you have to say yes. So if you're going to say yes, you've got to get somebody else's permission. If you're going to say no, I mean. Okay? They want everybody to think yes. Now, when have you been to your bank where the employees instantly said yes? Okay, now think about DHL Express. What would happen if we created an environment where 13,000 people, Samuel Strong, constantly understand their single goal during the day is to love the customer, to say yes, to have an over happy customer? FedEx, UPS, okay. And they want to make each customer feel special. Always keep customer promises. They believe that service recovery is important and they want you to think like the customer. They have free coin counting. If you had a bunch of coins and you went to your bank, is your bank going to count them for free? 
Probably not. They spend $35,000 at each branch having a free coin counting machine. And you're going to notice on the right is the kids counter, on the left is the one for adults. In 2006, they had 5.6 million transactions and they counted $425 million. On a recent day, after pouring in more than $20 in change and winning prizes for guessing the amount within $1.99, a seven-year-old child asks his father, can we come back soon? This is cool. Now, I'm sure that some of you have had your kids pull at your sleeve and say, Mom or Dad, please take me to McDonald's. Well, at Commerce Bank, they have kids asking their parents to take them to Commerce Bank. They have kids every day after school that go to Commerce Bank to play on the coin county machines. And everybody's empowered, so one of the headaches they have is sometimes the coin county machine's not working. And employees are empowered to drive a customer to another branch, to pay their taxi fare to another branch. Their goal is to take care of a customer. By the way, if I went to your bank in your country and I wanted to open an account, how long will it take? Or should I rephrase it and I say I wanted to go to your country and open a DHL account? How long will it take? Well, the first time I went into a commerce bank, it took 10 minutes. I got my checks. I had my credit card with my name on it. And I had my free internet site, you know, with my password and username so I could go in and check anything I had. And they gave me $10 to open the account. That was my first experience with Commerce Bank. Ten minutes, okay? So what would happen, you know, you're thinking about two days, Jared, you know, going from five to two days. Well, what would happen if we could get a situation where a guy could open an account at DHL Express in ten minutes? See, we need to think speed. We need to think about how do we do things faster than we've ever done it before. Now, here's a really interesting slide I love because this is the power of the strategy. This here is in, in Philadelphia. And if you look at Wachovia, which is one of Commerce Bank's biggest competitors, in 1994, it had a 25.5% market share. In the year 2000, it went down to 18%. In the year 2006, it went down to 14.2%. Now, here's the interesting thing. Wachovia spent billions of dollars during that time with acquisitions in that market, acquiring new companies, and they continued to lose market share. If you look here at PNC, they started with 10.8%, and in the year 2006, they were down to 7.3%, and PNC did the same thing. They spent billions of dollars in acquisitions. And Commerce Bank, if you notice here at the end, went from 1.6% up to 9.3% at the end of 2006. This here is what happens if you really master the service strategy. Okay? Now, Citibank is in Metro Philadelphia, and they're talking about pulling out. You know, they got a 2.5% market share. They can't compete with a commerce bank. Now, here's the really interesting stuff. This is in New York State. They opened four stores in Manhattan in September of 2001, after 9-11. Now, if you were going to open stores in Manhattan, what is the worst time in your life that you could open a new store in Manhattan, it'd have to be September. So at the end of the first quarter of 2002, they had four locations. At the end of 2006, they had 98 locations. They moved from zero revenue in September of 2001 to $10.4 billion. Now, these are not euros. One of the things I noticed, you know, that euros are a lot of money. Us U.S. dollars, you know, are like funny money when we get over there to Europe. Um, and you're going to notice on store pre-tax profit, right now they're making $38 million per store. Vernon Hill is going to do the same thing in London. The next year you'll see the same thing rolling out in London. I don't care where you go in the world. Let me tell you what. Customers love great customer service. And what it means is a customer experience. That means hours convenient to customers. It means great people. Here's the loyalty figures of Commerce Bank. 41% of the customers are loyal to Commerce Bank. You're going to notice Wachovia is 25%, JetBlue is 23%, Southwest Airlines is only 13%. Uh, 
Fred Carzino, the president of the regional banking, said commerce remains relationship oriented while other banks are transaction oriented. Let me tell you the objective I have is to make sure that DHL Express is not transaction oriented, but it is people oriented. Okay? And you have to walk the talk. Now, here's the problem every company in your country, every CEO in your country believes they're awesome at service. But when I'm in a marketplace and I ask, you know, who's the service leader, most people have trouble coming up with a service leader. We want to create an environment where the brand of DHL Express is not just for shipping, not for Express, but what would happen if we created a brand built around service? Why not outperform what a FedEx does? Why not be four times better than a FedEx? So. Here's some things I think what DHL can learn from what I just went through. FedEx owns the U.S. market. Commerce crushed Citibank and Chase in New York. I mean, this is a huge market, Manhattan. So the principles of customer service work. No one cares what the interest rate is at a bank, I think, Great customer service is what counts, and I think the same thing is true for DHL Express. So if you have an experience that is so unbelievable, you're going to find that price is no longer the core issue. Would you buy off on that? And then I believe if you can master the service strategy, it will dramatically generate revenue growth. I'm not talking about 5 and 10 and 20% increases. I'm talking about dramatically increasing your revenue growth. When Commerce Bank entered Manhattan, they interviewed 3,800 people and they hired 40 employees. Here's the question. When you have an opening in your market, how many people do you interview before you hire a person? Are you hiring only the cream? Or are you hiring a guy that has a pulse? At Commerce Bank, if you don't smile during the interview, there's no second interview. At Commerce Bank, they believe in service recovery. And it's easy to do business 24 hours a day with live people. Okay? These are some principles I think that absolutely work. And then at Commerce Bank, the CEO sleeps customer service. Vernon Hill, the, the former, uh, you know, the president of, of Commerce Bank, is the, probably the most customer-focused person I've ever met in my life. Stanley Marcus would probably be number two. Any, so we're going to keep covering this, and we'll come back to it. But these are some principles, hopefully, I shared with you that you can use from Commerce Bank. Uh, I believe in the service culture, everyone has a customer. And again, if you have 600 people, 36 people, 3,500 people, whatever the workforce is, 4,000 people, you got to make sure that each one of your employees has been trained on the art of service so when they see a customer, the customer says, oh my gosh, this is cool. It is DHL Express, right? So at Federal Express, they said, if you don't take care of your customers, somebody else will. Now, in each of your markets, you got a lot of competitors. You don't just have the UPS and the FedExes. You've got tons of smaller competitors in there. So keep in mind that if you don't provide incredible, unbelievable, exceptional, noticeable service 100% of the time to every single customer, hasta luego. Somebody is going to steal your customer. So let me give you some steps on how you can create a service culture at DHL. Number one, you've got to have a vision as a service leader, not as banking, manufacturing, shipping, and logistics. You've got to understand when you wake up during the morning, Roger, that you are now in the service business. Number two, you've got to use technology to drive business. You guys invest a lot of money in technology. Service leaders do that. Three is you've got to effectively build and develop employees. You're spending... I'll bet you millions of dollars a year, no, I bet you're spending millions of dollars a day on maintenance of aircraft. Spend a little bit of money every day 
building your people so that you have the best people in your country. And then you got to train all employees, not just the top 10%, not the top 40%. If you got 600 people, you better make sure that all 600 people are being developed and trained so that you have a high performing staff. And then you got to create customer friendly processes and procedures. You got to look at what can you do different to increase speed? What can you do different to get rid of dumb policies, rules, and procedures like Mexico has when you enter this country or like the United States has when you enter the United States where most countries have? So we see here's the problem with dumb procedures. They cost money. You got to hire somebody to manage it. And the person that's managing it, you know, that's their job. They are, it's very important you fill out all the little I's and the dot the T's and, or dot the I's and cross the T's. I mean, it's really, really important. Nobody does anything with that information. So take a look at the systems that you got in place at DHL Express. What can you do to make it easier for people to do business with you? And at the same time, what you're doing is you're increasing speed. Again, you could have the nicest people in the world. But you could just have crazy processes and systems that just cost you money. And then I believe customers value exceptional service. Not just good service, I'm talking about exceptional service. That's why financially at a commerce bank, the numbers flow. And if any of you can open an account at a commerce bank, I would encourage you to do it. So all I want you to do is benchmark a commerce bank. Okay. So you can see what happens with the customer experience. And then I think price by itself is not sustainable. Walmart built its company on customer service. The largest business in the world, the largest retailer in the world. For the last four years under the CEO Lee Scott, they forgot about service. The focus has only been on price. They have lost 95 billion dollars in market value. 95 billion dollars in market value because the marketplace does not perceive them as a service leader. So price by itself will never work. And then you gotta value employees and customers. And then we have to track results through sales and profit and then I believe service strategy will dramatically improve sales market share. So Roger said the best service pros are simply outstanding employees. That's really what we're talking about here today. Let me give you another example of a role model, which is Amazon. Number one goal is to be the Earth's most customer-centered company. How many here have ever bought a book from Amazon or a product from Amazon? Okay, a lot of hands went up. Here's the benefit of Amazon. You can order a book. You can order a product from them at midnight. You can be sitting in your home, naked. <laughs> midnight. And you can order a book or a product from Amazon. And then within 60 seconds, you're going to get an email confirmation coming back. The next day, you're going to get a tracking number for where the product was shipped and how it's been shipped. That's called speed, that's called customer service, that's called technology. Now let me tell you what, if you went to your local bookstore at midnight, naked, <laughs> you may get arrested. That's problem number one. Problem number two, there's little chance the bookstore will be open. And if it was, there's virtually no chance they're going to have what you wanted. But Amazon has technology. They have speed. Everything at Amazon is built around speed. They have incredible service recovery. In 1997, Jeff Bezos, the founder, wrote a letter to the shareholders, and they repeated it in 2007. And let's just go through the principles. Number one, focus relentlessly on our customers. Number two, make bold, long-term investment decisions. He's not interested in what happens for earnings for the next six months or the next quarter. He's looking at bold, long-term investment decisions. They work hard to spend wisely and maintain the lean culture. At Amazon, they are far more frugal 
They are more aggressive at eliminating waste than most other companies. And then they focus on hiring and retaining versatile and talented employees. They hire only the very best people. So this is supposed to be the service society, so where's the service? See, I think, wouldn't it be cool if we went into each of your markets and people said, who is the service leader? And they always said DHL Express. That's the brand that we want to create. Let me talk a little bit about speed. This is a new program that I created. And speed, to me, means dramatically reducing the amount of time needed to complete any task by altering your mindset, policies and procedures, using empowerment, looking at the systems that you got in place. Now think about when you were in college and you had a test and the professor on Monday said, I have a test for you. It's going to be Friday at 10 o'clock in the morning. When did you start studying for the test? Thursday night or Friday morning? Think about your employees. If you asked an employee to do something on a Monday morning, let's say it's 9 o'clock in the morning, it's going to take the employee one hour to do it, and you say, I need it Friday by 9 o'clock in the morning. When is your typical employee going to have that task done for you? Friday at 10, right? What would happen if you created an environment, Roger, where everybody thought speed? Every single individual. See, if you really look, DHL is all built on a company based on speed. You know, people typically are looking for speed. So what we want to do, in my opinion, if that's, see, that's why Amazon is so successful. By the way, Amazon this last year did $13 billion in revenue. In 1995, it had $511,000 in revenue. It went to $13 billion because they understand speed, technology, price, and everything's built around service. That's the same thing we want to do at a DHL. So culturally and socially speaking, I don't think it's in our nature to think speed. Now, if we look at Latin America, sometimes the Caribbean, speed is, you know, there's kind of a manana attitude. There's not as much of a culture of getting things done really fast. I think that if we could create an environment where every employee at a DHL Express thinks speed, whether it be answering the phone, handling a complaint, talking to a customer, and I'm not talking about trying to get the conversation off quick, but I mean taking care of the issue with incredible speed. That's, I think, a marketable tool. So part of what we need to do is work on the speed mindset was a willingness to actively look for opportunities to utilize speed every day in every task and project every encounter. I think that if you could get each employee to master a speed mindset, you're in really good shape. What do you think, Ian? Um, so speed is not just fast. Speed means dramatically reducing the time. So again, when I think of speed, if I want to enter a new account, let's move from five days, how about to two hours? Or one hour? Or Roger, how about 10 minutes? Okay. So how do we create this environment, Samuel, where everybody is constantly thinking speed? And so if we look at the speed mindset, we're talking about a willingness to look for opportunities to utilize speed every day, to think and act and work with speed, to create that mindset. It takes practice, it takes perseverance. So we need to do it fast, we need to do it now, we need to do it right. Speed begins with a do it fast, do it now, do it right attitude. I think speed creates an advantage over your competition. One of the difficulties in Latin America is that some of your competitors don't think speed. There's that, sometimes the manana attitude, uh, sometimes there's an attitude of ya voy, ya voy. Anybody ever hear that one? Okay. So we just need to create that environment where everybody is thick in speed, whether it be Canada, Mexico, Brazil. Now, this is one of my most favorite slides that I'm going to use today. And when Jeff Bezos from 
Amazon and Jerry Yang from Yahoo and Steve Case from AOL were asked, what's the source of your competitive advantage? It was creating a customer experience superior to anything the competitors can create. It wasn't the price, it wasn't the product, it was creating a customer experience. I think that's really what we want to do at a DHL is to create an experience superior to anything your competitors in your market area can create. I truly believe that if you can do that, you're going to own the market. Would you like to own the market? Of course, you guys already own the market. Some of you guys got like 60, 70 percent market share. I mean, in Mexico, you guys crush your competition. But just think what would happen if we could reduce our defection rate you know, from 14 to 18 percent, maybe we moved it down to 7 percent to 9 percent. You don't need no marketing money to do that, by the way. If you could cut your defection rate in half, you double the growth of your company. So we need to create a customer experience. And the experience really means sometimes procedures and policies, but a lot of it has to do with people. You already got nice people. It's just a matter of giving them the tools and making sure they're empowered. So either organizations must accelerate or they die. Let me give you another example, Southwest Airlines. Anybody ever fly Southwest Airlines? Okay, a bunch of hands went up. Uh, they've never had a strike. If you look at airlines everywhere in the world, they have huge labor problems. They don't have that problem at Southwest Airlines. It's the largest carrier of domestic passengers in the US. They don't fly to any of the Caribbean countries. They don't fly to Latin America. They have made money for 35 straight years. Last year, they made $645 million. Okay. This is, I think, what happens if you truly understand the service strategy. Colleen Barrett said, we are not an airline with great customer service. We are a great customer service organization that happens to be in the airline business. See, I think the problem with the Northwest Airlines, United, American, Continental, Mexicana, you know, all the different airlines you and I fly, is they think they're in the transportation business. They don't know they are in the service business. They don't need to make $645 million. By the way, Southwest Airlines and JetBlue put all of their competitors in the United States into bankruptcy about two years ago. That's the, by the way, that's the power of the service strategy, Samuel. In other words, what happened is that customers got so fed up with the American carriers where they had high prices, really, really bad service, and they went to Southwest Airlines and JetBlue. I think the same thing is true of uh, DHL Express. Wouldn't it be cool if you could help your competitors into bankruptcy because you mastered the service strategy? And remember, we're talking about how do we create a customer experience that is so awesome that a guy goes and tells all of his friends and his buddies, let me tell you what you got to use, DHL, okay? That's called word of mouth advertising. Roger Crook said, we are not an express carrier with great customer service. We are a great customer service organization that happens to be in the express business. So the major paradigm switch is that DHL Express in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, in Mexico, in Canada, in Guatemala, in Costa Rica, in El Salvador, is in the service business, okay? And if you can create, in my opinion, that mindset with every single employee, because you got three seconds with customers, your customer can tell in three to four seconds whether your employee loves them or whether they're considered a pain in the rear end, okay? 
Now, the good news with Latin Americans is that people are always nice. It's just a little bit more of the, of the, of the slowness type of thing and the, and, the, and the lack of speed. So at Southwest Airlines, they said people are our most valuable asset, although we fly planes, Southwest Airlines is really a customer service company. Now, here's the paradigm switch. I think that of all companies in the United States, Southwest Airlines is probably better at getting their workforce to understand that. And they walk the talk and they practice it. I truly believe that we can do the same thing with DHL Express. Although we, and you guys do the same thing, aren't you? You fly planes. Although we're in the express business, Southwest, DHL Express is really a customer service company. That's the paradigm switch. Commerce Bank understands it's not a bank. They know they're in the service business. Most banks in Latin America, the Caribbean, Canada, the United States don't know they're in the service business. Now here's the slide I really like, Roger, is that Southwest Airlines market capitalization is worth 300% more than all the competitors combined. See, what happens in the marketplace is that they love great service and they can tell who walks the talk and who's full of baloney. You notice I cleaned up my act there. I didn't say some naughty words, right? So the marketplace values a service leader. So Bonn, you know, the German operation, you could drive the value of the company by creating an image totally built around service. I wouldn't be surprised, and I don't have the research on it, that FedEx... Part of the stock premium is based on its image. Okay. So you want to do the same thing at DHL on a global basis, but particularly in the Americas. Herb Kaler, the chairman, said you have to treat your employees like your customers. When you treat them right, they'll treat your outside customers right. So let's look at some principles and strategies I think Southwest Airlines uses. Number one, they understand they're in customer service, not an airline. We got to make sure that DHL doesn't sell, that it sells service, not boxes. Okay? They use technology to increase speed and reduce costs. They were the first airline to introduce ticketless option, the first airline to introduce where you could book a ticket on the internet. They value employees. Let me tell you another interesting thing. At Southwest Airlines, they pay 50% less than any, emplo any employee working for Continental Airlines, U.S. carriers, uh, Northwest Airlines. They pay 50% less. And people love their company and they love their job. Money does not motivate employees. You could double. You could go back to your country tomorrow. You could double everybody's salary. And guess what would happen? In 30 days, productivity would be at the exact same level it's at today and you'd be in serious trouble financially. Okay? What you really need to do is use recognition, and that's what Southwest Airlines does. They use price to drive the business, because when they enter a market, they're one-third of what everybody else does. Now, why can they enter the market and provide a price for one-third of what everybody else? They're very frugal. They are more aggressive at eliminating costs than the other carriers. And then it's a great place to work. People love working for Southwest Airlines. They attract high-performance employees. Recognition, not money, drives performance. They use speed. Now, when you, when they have a turnaround time, it's 25 minutes at Southwest Airlines. Most carriers take an hour. 25 minutes means they need a whole lot less planes. And you guys, you know, John Mullen the other day, yesterday, talked about the cost of a plane. It's like, what, 60 million bucks? So you need a whole lot less planes if you have more speed. And then the marketplace values the service leader. So if you create a brand built around service, and I'm not talking about talking the talk, I'm talking about walking the talk, okay? Who's here from Peru? Anybody from Peru? Two people. Okay, you're familiar with Wong in Peru. The most customer-driven company in the country, would you agree? I mean, they have a huge brand built around customer service. You want to do the same thing with DHL. 
And then at Southwest Airlines, they use their assets more effectively. So one of the principles I talk about here is we got to make sure we don't hire employees who hate customers. So in the hiring places, why don't we hire one out of 50 or one out of 100 instead of one out of one or one out of two? And then at Amazon, Jeff Bezos said he believed in hiring the best, smartest people available regardless of previous experience. He said recruiting was always a team effort. The la he made the last calls and whoever they hired someone, his attitude was if they're not on the A-list, then they're not interested. I wouldn't be surprised that if DHL, if you and your country could hire a higher caliber person, you'd get more results. You need to be a little bit more careful. Lee Sanderson from Southwest Airlines said, hire for the heart and then teach the test. I wouldn't be surprised in your business, attitude is dramatically more important than the skill. I wouldn't be surprised at DHL Express, you could teach the skills. It's attitude that counts. So let me talk a little bit about empowerment. If you look at Webster's definition, it's to authorize, enable, permit, to give power and authority to. My definition is that every employee has to be able to make a fast decision on the spot to take care of a customer to the customer's satisfaction. And there, the problem with empowerment, and this is global, is that most employees are afraid that if they make an empowered decision, what's going to happen? What's the number one fear? The number one fear is they're going to get fired. Huge fear. Now, if you look at the Caribbean and Latin America, most people don't want to lose their job. DHL is a nice company. So if you have a choice between taking care of a customer or losing your job, most people would say, the heck with the customer. So you got to have empowerment. That means that every employee, regardless of their level, has to use a little bit of common sense. And we're not talking about the deal in France where they gave away $7 billion. You know, what we're talking about is people making quick decisions on the spot. Frankly, and we're going to talk about service recovery, I think if you have empowerment, you, you solve a lot of your problems. And, and I know that I've heard John talk about it, Roger talk about it. Everybody wants empowerment. The difficulty that you got in the task is to make sure that every employee you got makes a fast decision during the day, and it better be in favor of the customer. If you have an over-happy customer, you make a lot of money. A lot of money. That's how you get customer retention. There's two ways to drive empowerment. One is recognition, and the other is celebration. So when you catch people making empowered decisions, they're bending and breaking rules, they're doing wild things, you got to make a big deal out of it so everybody else says, oh my God, and they didn't get fired. Okay. Four dirty little secrets of empowerment. Number one is the greatest fear is it, management tends to not trust customers. We think that customers are lying cheats. We have to overcome that. Number two problem we have to overcome is sometimes we don't trust employees. We're thinking we got this lying, cheating customer that's going to take advantage of our dumb employee. Number three problem that we got to overcome is that a lot of managers don't want empowerment. See, if you really had empowerment, you don't need as many managers. Number four problem that we have to overcome is that most managers, most employees rather, don't get down on their knees at night and say, dear God, please give me empowerment. Okay? So we got to create this environment because whether you have 40 employees or 200 or 400 or 4,000, the real magic, I think, in customer experience is that when that little guy out there somewhere in your operation is on the phone in person says to the customer, oh my gosh, sir, there is nobody at DHL Express that is more important than you. Let me tell you what I'm going to do, because, sir, we really appreciate your business. Right? And then you want that person to make an empowered decision. So training is the key to empowerment, and empowerment is the key to creating a service culture. One of the things that I've noticed, and I've been at this stuff for 38 years, longer than anybody, probably longer than, than some of you are born, what I notice is that companies buy something, maybe they bring a speaker in here to a conference like this and we get everybody all pumped, and then we forget about it. 
So the key if you want to create a service culture is you get to have Jared, new stuff at first choice, constantly moving it to another level. So you get your foot in the accelerator pedal going 100 miles an hour. Because the difficulty you got is that you got employees that are just waiting for you to disappear. They're hoping to God that this is a one-time deal. They don't want more. They want to go back to what they were doing. What you want to make sure is that your employees live the customer experience 24 hours a day. So if you're going to design training strategies, use material that's fun, exciting, entertaining. Hammer away at fundamentals, 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 fundamentals. Who is the wealth, who's the most successful golfer in the world? Tiger Woods makes $120 million a year because he focuses on the basics. He spends more time practicing every day than any golfer on the circuit. But see the other golfers? They don't need to make $120 million a year. So if you want the best employees in your country, make sure you hammer away at fundamentals and basics, fundamentals and basics. If you have fundamentals, it's awesome. Wouldn't it be great if the driver always called everybody by their name? Wouldn't it be cool when the person answers the phone if they always remembered the customer and used the customer's name? And then you gotta have quality packaging. Whatever tools you gotta use, make sure that the product you give the employees is beautifully put together. Whoops, I went back. And then you gotta use experiential learning. So 80% of the training time has gotta be group discussion, group interaction. And then the last, which is the most important, you gotta build people from within. The weakness that you have is that in this room, I have the most successful people within the Americas, right here. I have people that probably are well-educated and they make good money. But if we reach out to your employees, you got people that, some of them live from paycheck to paycheck. Some of them have personal problems. Some of them have problems with their girlfriends and their boyfriends. Some of them have problems with bill collectors. And then they're supposed to be cheerful all day when they come to work. And then maybe at the first five minutes on the job, the customer's screaming at them. And they're supposed to be cheerful the balance of the day. So we have to uplift the spirit of your employee so they feel good about themselves. You've got to elevate their self-worth. Very important element. Let's talk about service recovery, and then we're going to be open for, for questions and answers. I think this is probably one of the most critical things that DHL Express needs to master. You're always going to have problems with technology. There are always going to be breakups. There's always going to be some kind of a screw-up happening. Service recovery is for the very elite. I think it has to happen on the front line or it doesn't happen at all. And what we're talking about is how do we solve a problem instantly? So how do we take a customer from hell to heaven in 60 seconds or less? How many would like to know how to do that? That's all. <laughs> Let me ask the question again. How many would like to take a customer from hell to heaven in 60 seconds or less? And it works, okay? Let me show you how to do that. I'm talking about how do you create an experience. Now think about, it. you got a guy on the phone, you got somebody talking to the driver, you got somebody, and he, do people in Latin America get really upset? How about the Caribbean? Canadians? <laughs> now think, somebody is really mad, okay? Really upset. How do you take that opportunity and create an experience? that within 60 seconds, the guy thinks he has touched heaven. That's what we're going to talk about. Would you like to know how to do that? Okay. Let me give you an example. The good looking guy on the left up here, that's me. That's Vail, Colorado, probably the most customer driven ski mountain in the world. Some of you, I mean, you guys come from such neat countries. I've been in most of your countries, really nice countries, but you don't have a lot of snow. In Colorado, they have a lot of snow. Minnesota has a lot of snow. Uh, a couple years ago, I was on a ski lift in Vail, and I was stuck for an hour on the ski lift. Three different times, the ski patrol came down and told us what the problem was. When we got to the top of the ski mountain, there were several people from Vail to greet us. Now, if you're sitting on a chairlift for an hour, you're not skiing, it's cold out, is there a chance? Somebody might be a little grumpy, unhappy. So when we got there, they gave each of us a free drink ticket. 
Now, do you think I'd be talking about Vail today for a free drink ticket? No. Okay. They then gave each of us two free lift tickets. A lift ticket today is worth $89. Okay? 89 bucks. Now, when you ski at Vail, there's a chairlift that always typically holds four people. So there was only my friend and I, Ron Wiesman and myself. So we're riding up the chair the balance of the day, and we kept telling everybody, hey, we got stuck on chair 23 today, and we each got two free lift tickets. I called home that night. I told my wife, I said, Pat, I got stuck on the chair today at Vail for an hour, and they gave me two free lift tickets. She said, oh, that's cool. I called my son Matthew. He said, Dad, that's really cool. Next day, we're riding up the chairs. He said, we were stuck on chair 23 yesterday, and we each got two free lift tickets. Now, let me ask you a question. How much do you think the drink ticket cost Vail? Probably 50 cents, right? How much do you think the two lift tickets cost them? Nothing! They own the ski mountain. Guess what? You guys got shipping, right? So when you guys screw up, you can give things away that have value instantly to the customer. Now, at Vail, the ski lifts running are very important. So when I got back to Minneapolis, I thought, what happened? What happened? So I called up Vail. And I said, who's in charge of the lifts? And they gave me this good-looking guy on the right, Clyde, whoops, Clyde Weisner. And I talked to Clyde. And now when I go to Vail, I go out and ski with them for a few runs. They have a policy at Vail. Running the ski lifts, just like at DHL, getting the package there when promise is a key, what, the number one part of your business, okay? Well, at Vail, the ski lifts running is pretty important. So they have a process in place. They didn't say, gosh, I heard a rumor there's a chairlift down. They I mean, it's the process. They know where it's down for how many minutes, and they got a process in place. They had coupons, coupons pre-printed, you know, for the free drink tickets and the free lift tickets, okay? They have a system in place called service recovery because their goal is to have over-happy customers. They have the richest people in the world that go skiing at Vail. For those from Mexico, man, I got half of the people, I think, are from Mexico at Vail, okay? All the rich people. Uh, well, this is what we want to teach. So here's the four principles. All of you have a little technique card that we use that I'm talking about here. Here's the four principles I'm talking about. And I think for complaint handling, if you guys do this, you'll never have another complaint. See, I don't think you need a complaint handling department. What you want is you want it solved, Jared, in 60 seconds by whoever hears the problem so that the customer says, my God, this is the greatest company in the world, okay? So four things we want employees to do. We want them to act quickly, take responsibility, be empowered, and compensate. Now, I believe that less than 1% of the companies in the world know how to spell service recovery. This is for the very, very elite, okay? But it's absolute magic. I don't care how good you are at service, because you're human, mistakes are going to happen. There's nothing you can do to prevent a mistake. Okay? But when it happens, how do we solve the problem in 60 seconds so the customer is over happy? Now, I believe when there's a problem, most people lie. I don't know if you'd agree with that. And, and so I don't want people to lie. I just want them to be honest. And we're going to talk about the four steps. Now, I'm going to give you another example of this before we move on. Visualize you're at a restaurant. You have a reservation for 7 o'clock. There's four of you. I should say 8 o'clock because, no, I'll say 9 o'clock because these are a lot of Latins and you guys eat late, okay? So the reservation's for 9 o'clock. The restaurant is really busy because it's here in Mexico. And you, and you get there and the hostess says, sir, we got a problem. We're not going to be able to see you until at least 9.30. What would happen if the hostess said, sir, we, because we can't seat you till 9.30? Samuel, you know, you're probably the most important customer we have in our restaurant tonight. Would it be okay if I bought you and your party a round of drinks while you're waiting to be seated? What would you say? You'd say, 
not bad. So now think about this, okay? Think of the strategy. You're sitting down, you're having a drink. Instead of swearing, bitching about the company, you're saying, man, this is cool. Can you believe this, okay? And see, that's what we want to happen at DHL. Because things are going to happen. Things are going to go wrong. But what we don't want somebody to do is say, let me talk to my country manager. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. He's still in Cancun. <laughs> we want the little guy out there who's close to the action to use empowerment, to use the four principles. So let's go through those. The DHL employee, the point of contact, best implement service recovery. I never want this to ever go up the ladder. The most important person I said earlier is your frontline guy. You, it costs too much money to move a thing up. The, you, you file this complaint process system. What would happen if you never had a complaint anymore? Because an employee just solved the problem. Now, obviously, if a person ships something and they're not going to get it for two weeks, it's a heck of a problem. But what would happen if a person did the four steps and said, sir, we can't find your package and it's all our fault? We really screwed up here at DHL. Okay? And I'm going to solve the problem right now. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put $100 into your account. Because frankly, you know, uh, you're the most important customer we have here in Mexico. That's what we're talking about. Okay? So time is of the essence. I think you've got 60 seconds to make this stuff happen. I'm going to give you an example in a few minutes of somebody that didn't do this in 60 seconds. You've got to take responsibility. No matter who's at fault, you don't say, yeah, it's shipping. It's the plane. It's the, it's the guy in accounting. Never blame anybody. It's all you got to do is say, we made the mistake. And by the way, if you're the one that made the mistake, what's the big deal about just saying, you know what? I screwed up and it's all my fault. What's the big deal? Don't make excuses or lie. Don't, put, don't disagree with the customer. Don't say, you know, I think you didn't put the right address on there. Don't ever disagree with the customer. Don't put the blame off to somebody else. And then you've got to admit mistakes. It'll make you an uncommon person. But the key is if you get the little guy at the bottom. I got the top mucky mucks at DHL in this room. It's too late if it comes to you. I want the little guy standing around out there interfacing with your customer to be able to do this in 60 seconds or less. So when a customer approaches an employee with a complaint and says, sir, at DHL, we have a policy. That is like putting gasoline on a fire. It's huge, okay? The airlines love to do that. Northwest Airlines. I was flying to uh, South Africa. It had like an eight or a $10,000 ticket. I was eight pounds overweight on one piece of luggage. And this person at the ticket counter was like, man, I got you, you sucker. <laughs> you know? And, and she made me keep taking stuff out of that suitcase till I was only one and a half pounds overweight. Now, what do you think I did with the extra luggage? I put it on my carry-on bag. See, what the employee should have said is, my gosh, sir, you're probably, the, you're a platinum elite. You're, you're going to South Africa. You're our most important customer. Don't worry about it. Do you think, by the way, Northwest Airlines would have gone broke had they waived eight and a half pounds? What would happen if somebody had a problem with a shipping issue and your little employee out there said, don't worry about it, sir. There is nobody more important in our country than you. And we're going to take good care of you because we love you and we love your business. Okay? So you've got to be empowered. That means every employee has to make a fast decision and it again better be in favor of the customer. Empowerment constrained by policy is not any good. And then you got to compensate, and that's the magic here. So, so just say, sir, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to see you till 9.30, doesn't work. Sorry that you had to wait in the, on the chair left for an hour, sir, we apologize. That's nice, but that's not the elite. So I believe if DHL can move to the process where you do the four steps we talk about here, act quickly. Quickly means all of this has to happen. 
I'm not talking about eliminating the complaint to fire and, and you know, but I'm talking about you want this stuff happen in 60 seconds or less. Does anybody remember in February of last year what happened to JetBlue with the winter snowstorm in New York City? They had 150 people stuck on a plane for 13 hours. Now, JetBlue had a reputation of the most, you know, of Southwest Airlines and JetBlue of being a customer service role model. They had plush leather seats. I mean, they had built this huge image on service. But what happened is they were stuck on the plane for 13 hours and every single newspaper in the United States and every TV station in the United States had a full page coverage on this thing the next day. If you had to buy the negative publicity, it would be several hundred million dollars. David Nelman, the president at that time, gave everybody the next day a free round trip airline ticket for compensation. Problem is it was too late and too cheap. Free round trip ticket on JetBlue is maybe $200. So people were going to Cancun or wherever, you know, on cruises and they missed their flights. So let me tell you what happened to JetBlue. This is because they didn't use service recovery. The CEO lost his job. They had hundreds of millions of dollars in negative publicity. The value of the company decreased by 50%. Now let me tell you what a pilot could have done on that plane. He could have said, Passengers, we got a heck of a problem. We're stuck in this snowstorm. The ground crew says it's not safe to get off the plane. And, and I know that we have problems with the bathroom. We don't have enough food. Uh, because of the inconvenience, what I'm going to give each of you on this plane is a free round-trip airline ticket for each hour that you're on the plane. Do you like that? Hour four comes along, the pilot says, now you have each earned four tickets. Hour 10 comes along, the pilot says, each of you have earned 10 free airline tickets. Now, the out-of-pocket cost might have been about $75,000, okay? But now visualize 150 people getting off the plane, and they all said, my God, do you realize that we can fly anywhere we want for the next few years because we got 13 free tickets airline tickets for each person on this plane. This is cool, right? Instead, they lost $32 million because of that deal. So I truly believe at DHL Express, if I can get you guys to master service recovery, if there's one thing I talked about here today that if you can put into place, the results are instantaneous. Bottom line is you don't lose a customer because when a customer is upset, they say, goodbye DHL, here comes FedEx or UPS or one of the other local carriers. You don't ever want it to happen. The, I, I forgot to ask Samuel how much money you spend a month on marketing in the Americas. Would it be like $5 million a month? Less or more? $2 million? $2 million. Okay, I'm just going to use an analogy. Let's say you're spending $2 million a month on marketing. That's $24 million a year. Do you realize that half of that, Samuel, is wasted? <laughs> but here's the problem. Nobody, nobody knows which half. Well, most of it is in the country, so you Okay, but, but I, I'm just, <laughs> most of it's in the country. So my, my point, my point is, that half of your marketing money is wasted. Nobody knows what works. Now you got a real customer in front of you, okay? A really live customer. There's a problem. You want to spend your marketing money in 60 seconds where that guy gets off the phone or gets away from that, the live person and he says, oh my God. And he gets on the phone, he calls on his cell phone to his buddies and say, let me tell you what happened with DHL. These guys are unbelievable. By the way, sometimes people are negative. And here was a deal that was in the, uh, uh, on the internet and, and it was talking about a person, it says in uh, two weeks to the day since DL, DHL picked up my two day delivery from Amazon's headquarters and my package is still not here. Oh, they've told me it will be. Dwayne is, 
the uh, customer service rep with whom I spoke on Saturday reassured me that the package is on the way and that it would be delivered today. And it goes on and on and on in a very negative one. Now, here's service recovery. This person says, I posted three separate entries about the 17 days it took for a two-day package to arrive via DHL Express. DHL in Kansas City apparently did not forget about the problem, though. Greg F., the regional manager for DHL in the area, had driven all the way out of town to apologize for the service problem. You could have picked me up. No, you could have picked me up off the floor. I was just stunned. He was downright nice and careful to tell me that the delivery driver had not been completing the route, a problem of which the now former manager was not aware. He said something that should have never happened, and he was very sincere about how much effort the company is putting into improving customer service. And then she went on to say, additional, actually, yes, a company that would take such steps to not only follow up on a pro problem, but also to deliver a personal apology strikes me as one that is intent on earning my business. It would be unreasonable not to give them a second chance. Don't you agree? Okay. That's what you want people to do. You are going to make mistakes. Your company is going to make mistakes. By the way, all of your competitors, they got the same problem. They're going to make mistakes. So, you can't, I can't fix your technology problems, but what I can do is teach you the principles of service recovery so that when something goes wrong, you do four steps. Let's go through them quickly. Number one, act quickly. Number two, take responsibility. Number three, be empowered. And number four is compensate. And the magic is when the little bitty guy on the bottom does this. Because when you do it, you're too powerful. You're the, the gurus. You're the, the heavy honchos here. You're the movers and the shakers. The magic is when the little guy on the bottom does it. I truly believe, Samuel, if we can get service recovery installed so that every single person, 13,000 people strong, realize my number one job is to take care of a customer. And if something goes wrong, I'm going to use service recovery to make them over happy. I think if you do that, you're going to kill your competition. I truly believe passing a complaint up the chain of command costs too much money. So when service recovery becomes a way of life, customers are loyal for life at DHL. Fred Weichel wrote a book talking about defections. And he says, if a typical company loses 15 to 20 percent of its customers every year, he said, if you could cut your defection rate in half, you will double the growth of your business. That's really what I was talking about. It's called customer retention. So what you want to do is make sure that your 13,000 people practice and master the art of service, that you understand the service strategy. If you could just reduce in your country the the defection rate by just 5%, you're going to have profit swings of 25 to 100%. So what we've been talking about here is service is a skill, it's a technique, it's professionalism, and it's an art. I ha and, and if you look here at Roger, he said, our employees still remain our best asset as we strive to create a great customer experience by creating a great employee experience. That's really what we've been talking about here this morning. Correct, Roger? I had a chance to work with Stanley Marcus when he was alive, and Mr. Marcus was the chairman of Neiman Marcus. He said, we have to respect our customers. Second, you have to learn to love them, and eventually you will adore them. I think if we could get 13,000 people to master these principles, your competition screwed. That's how you crush the competition. That's how you build market share. That's how you own the market. Now, you guys already in each of your markets are really big players. But wouldn't it be really cool if you started to do what Southwest Airlines did and they put their competitors out of business? Would you like to do that, Roger? Would you like to put a few of your competitors and let them go to sleep? Okay, That's really what we've been talking about. Listen, you have been an outstanding audience. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be here in Cancun with DHL Express. 
and now I'm going to be open for some questions and answers. Thank you. Questions? I've never seen an audience not ask questions, so. John, I'll ask one. Thanks for your comments. I appreciate it. Uh, hope it's not too warm in Cancun compared to Minneapolis. So, so many people that you talk to probably get it and they say we want to do this and they genuinely try to do the things that you say and they still fail. So what's the thing that most companies who sincerely want to do better and try and they think they're doing what you're suggesting but they fall flat somewhere? What's the most common failure? I think the, the most common failure is that companies do one-shot seminars like this. They do one-shot training programs. Uh, I think if you want to create a service culture, you can have new stuff, fresh stuff, new stuff, fresh stuff. Uh, Vernon Hill told me, who is, I mean, is unbelievably focused. He says it's a thousand cuts they try to take on customer service. He says you just got to be focusing on it day in and day out. And so if I was you in your market, you know, I would believe it. I would talk about it. I'd make sure everybody's trained on service. And if you do that, this stuff will start working for you. And then I measure, measure the results. See, I think financially, if you know how much money it makes you, you'll get religion. In the service leaders, like a Southwest Airlines and a Commerce Bank, they know financially how much money it makes, so they got religion. More questions? We'll get a microphone. What have you found as a best practice for allocating in the budget for recovery, service recovery? I, I would, I'd recommend you take a small percentage of your marketing budget, advertising budget, and use it, you know, for service recovery and training and development of people. <laughs> See, you know, <laughs> See it, it's, it's like the... And Samuel, it's like the, the, uh, the commercial that you showed us when you started this morning, which I thought was really cool. Now, what happens if we can get every single employee to perform and do that every day? That's all marketing. So don't look at this as training. Don't look at it as first training. That is a marketing opportunity to destroy your competition. I have a question. Typically what happens um, with service recovery, over time the customer learns the business and they start to take advantage. How do you prevent that from happening? Well, you know, one of the other concerns is that maybe you're going to give the customer too much. But let's say that, that you, a customer gets a little bit too much or, you, or they, they start to do it a little bit more often. What's the worst thing that can happen? You have an over-happy customer. You want to pray to God that you have over-happy customers. If you have over-happy customers, your competition is dead. Okay? This is simply marketing money. Okay? Now, here's the other thing. You want to be so good you don't make mistakes anymore. But service recovery says you have made a mistake. Or the customer believes you made a mistake. Either one is correct. Okay? You better be spending some money to keep that customer over-happy. Next. John. Um, your service recovery uh, four steps are really very valuable. Maybe the most challenging situation is, uh, and unfortunately it happens often, is that the implications of our failure are far higher in cost to the customer than the value that you can compensate. Any suggestion in these kind of situations? I think that's a really good statement, and I would agree with that, but that's why you just want to simply uh, give them something of value. Now, maybe you need to give away $300 in shipping or $500 in shipping for certain situations. Uh, what are the, here's the thing I want you to be thinking about. What are the things that you have that don't cost DHL a lot of money, that have value in the eyes of the customer, that you can give away free, okay? that have value. So at Vail, they know giving away free lift tickets has high value. If you ordered flowers, you got to pay for the flowers. When you give away, you know, and there could be other things other than just free shipping that have high value. Now, ground shipment, your margins aren't real good. But international shipments are much greater. So what are the things that you got that have value? 
you have screwed up. This is marketing money now. You either say, goodbye, Mr. Customer, and I'm going to go out and spend a lot more money to get a new customer, or I'm going to spend a little bit of money right now in 60 seconds. And that's what you want to do. See, here's the other thing I'm trying to talk about. You want word of mouth marketing. You want to create an experience that's so cool that the guy says he has to go out and tell 10 other people. So had they only given me a free drink ticket, I would have never talked about them, never put them in my books, never even put them in my newsletters. But they, they created an experience so remarkable. That's what you want to do. So what are the products and services in your country that have value. Maybe you do the same thing, you have coupons like Vail does. But you need a process in place and the magic is when the little guy on the bottom says to the customer, you know what? We screwed up and it's all our fault. Now, Roger, here's an important issue. You may have to take out more insurance. Some customers may die from a heart attack because they've never had anybody ever say, we made a mistake, and it's all our fault. Okay? Nobody has ever, I could count on one hand all the times I've ever had an employee say that to me in my life. Okay, next. Um, a question. I read a book uh, some time ago that was written by the founder of Southwest, where he explained how they improved this uh, customer service by doing layouts of the different processes that since the customer arrived to get the ticket and board and so on. So I wonder if uh, you have some experience of, about what kind of techniques are the uh, today companies, uh, the best ones, using to realize what do they need to remove in the process or what do they want, do they need to include that they don't have today in the process in order to be more efficient and deliver better service? Well, Gustavo, your, your customers are really going to constantly tell you what are the stupid things you do. If you just listen to your customers and then eliminate that stuff, you'll make a lot of money. Your customers know everything. In Southwest Airlines, the pr principles, they know they're a customer service company. Uh, next person. Roger's got the mic. Um, we have a wide range of customers. So we have consumers, small companies, multinationals, the full range. So doing server recovery for consumer is much easier than it is for a multinational because you can add value or give value to a consumer very easily by saying, okay, we'll give you a free shipment or free a number of free shipments. But for the multinational uh, customer where you've got a, a buyer or a purchaser who's really your customer at the end of the day, giving them free shipments doesn't mean much to them. So what do we do for different types of customers? I think for your, your larger customer, the commercial customer where there's a lot of money, uh, you, you need to be thinking about what are the things that have value to that customer that would overwhelm them. And it could be baseball tickets, it could be, uh, uh, it, you know, it could be a much larger amount of, of money. UPS at one time lost uh, uh, a huge package of stuff that I shipped from Minneapolis to Mexico, and they said the truck went into the river. I lost an $18,000 account for it, I got $300 back. And I was not a very happy camper with, with UPS. So um, you, you, I would encourage you to take a look at the, the products that you got and then come up with issues that have value. One of the things you can do is just ask customers. But see, part of the magic of service recovery, we made a mistake and it's all our fault. Nobody has ever heard those words before. I agree. It's working, yeah. I agree with you. I think that uh, we have a problem in admitting the mistakes when running our customer service centers because we have, uh, uh, we have to become more, much more proactive than we are right now. And I think that uh, a key element on our service delivery process is our ability to follow up 
and make sure that we reach our customers and tell them exactly what's going on. Because for them, it's very important to receive the package. So we need to change the attitude, come up with a kind of a strategy that we can keep constantly following up where the package is and at the same time have the freedom to provide some kind of compensation. Are you Antonio? Yes, I am. Ah, we've yeah. never met. Right. Okay, the end. So I think that that could be the great point of changing the attitude. We, we have in our company what we call the customer interaction survey. There are six attributes that we uh, follow to make sure that the customer reach the level that they, that they need. Five of them is just attitude, which is being friendly, admitting mistakes, and then being able to provide proactive solutions, you know, and keep informing where we are. So I think that uh, when the kind of experience that you bring to us is really in line with that, you know. So change the attitude and become the owner of, uh, of the situation. You know, I don't know if you would agree with that. I'd, I'd agree. I'd say that 95% of the time, my experience is employees lie. That's not good. That's why, first step, act, quick, act quickly. Number two, take responsibility. We made a mistake, and it's our fault. Absolute magic. Somebody else had a microphone. I do, right here. Hi, um, I'm in sales, and uh, quite recently, we've lost two major contracts with large customers because of service areas and we held up our hands and said you know the fault was ours we brought all the management attention on it a lot of resources were, were involved in trying to fix and address the issues um, and both these contracts that we lost the reason why we lost them was because the value to the customer of these shipments hinged on other contracts which to them were worth you know half a million a million dollars so at what stage does it get to where you need to say okay we screwed up, which we did, and we admitted that, versus the compensation that you can give to the customer. So how do you balance those out, and, 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 and how do you figure out its impact on the business for the major customers? So when you got a half a million dollar contract, you can't give away a half a million dollars no, in terms not. of service recovery. Uh, so you're going to, and I don't have, unfortunately, I'm sure you're waiting for the magic words for me, but I don't have the correct solution for that. But, I, but you're going to have to think about what has value instantly. But remember, what I'm talking about is speed, okay? Act quickly. You're going to say, we made the mistake. You're going to give things away that have some value. Then you still got to find the package, but you are taking responsibility. You're empowered. Uh, my suspicion is that most people run and they delay the thing and they don't work on it. So all you got to do is fess up really fast and then work to solve the problem. But I don't have the, when it's a half a million dollar deal and a guy's got to lose a half a million dollars, I, you know, that's a, that's a hell of a problem. And I don't have the answer. <laughs> okay, it is now, uh, I am really out of time. And uh, so I, again, thank you so very much for allowing me to be part of DHL. Uh, I am counting on you guys to destroy your competition. I'm counting on DHL Express to crush your competition. I'm counting on you guys to impress Roger by you because you're going to double revenues this year. Correct, Roger? And Samuel, thank you so very, very much. Thank you so much. I think it was a great speech. Uh, I'm actually going to do this for the first time now. Okay. Since you made a comment about marketing budgets and giving it to other people. So I'm going to act quickly. Okay. Take responsibility. So we're actually going to take the blame for not keeping customers as marketing. Um, be empowered. That means that I can now make a decision to uh, allocate some of the budget to the customer service group. So. So you have it in country and you do whatever it takes to, uh, to get the customer back. And we need to run some numbers because... <laughs> but I commit to that and then compensate, which I'm doing right now by giving you my budget. So thank you. Great. So great. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you.